if I uh, can convene us all, thank you um, um, uh, all for coming. Good morning. Uh, for those who I don't know I'm, and those on the web, I'm Sandra Galea, and uh, I have the great privilege of serving as Dean of School of Public Health at Boston University. And um, welcome to um, this uh, symposium. These symposia are, um, we do roughly quarterly at the school, and they really are an opportunity for us to convene people who we respect and admire who have interesting thoughts about issues that we think are important. And th they are a way for us to bring our community together and to sharpen our thinking about issues that we think matter for the health of populations. And uh, today we're here to talk about an issue that really matters to the health of populations, which is death and dying. The, uh, you know, the data are pretty clear that 100% uh, of us will die. Um, uh, and uh, you know, I've been wanting to say that for a year. The, sometimes when you, um, when you read the popular media, you sort of think that that's not necessarily the case because we're going to solve um, mortality um, sometime soon. I'm here to tell us that that's actually not the case. We, we're all going to die, and that's okay. That's actually okay because um, our goal should be to think about how we approach death and dying at a population level so that we can live the healthiest, fullest, richest lives we can until such time. And... Um, in many respects, I actually think that then, when you look at it that way, the issue of death and dying becomes really core to the entire mission of public health, because public health should be about creating the conditions that we can live long, healthy lives so we can all die healthy. So today's symposium really emerges from those ideas, bringing together people who can help us think through how is it that we create the kind of lives that lead to good deaths. And that's what we're really trying to think about today. A few acknowledgments before I move forward. This. Um, event really is the brainchild of a series of conversations that uh, emerged with professors George Annis and Professor Chris Gill, who you'll hear from later on today. Um, really about a year, year and a half ago, we started having these conversations in parallel, leading to us saying, let's bring some people together to talk about it. It's also been a partnership with the, with the um, Boston University's College of Communication, led by Dean Tom Fiedler, um, the College of Arts and Science Center for Humanities, led by Susan Mizruki, who you'll hear from later on today, and from our own uh, public health program for global health storytelling, led by Professor Jen Beard. And uh, centrally, this is one of sort of an annual series of events that we do in partnership with the Pulitzer Center, um, uh, led by John Sawyer. The Pulitzer Center and the School of Public Health have had a relationship for almost a decade now. And in the past few years, really, we have um, been uh, working hard with that to, to capitalize on the two worlds in which we inhabit, the world of journalism and us, the world of academic public health thinking, to create events like this that I think exist at the intersection of the two areas, um, uh, generating ever more interesting thoughts. John. Good morning. Thank you, Sandro, and thanks to all of you uh, for being here. The Pulitzer Center is a nonprofit journalism um, center. We do about 150 reporting projects uh, every year on issues ranging from war and peace to poverty, food security, mass incarceration, and religion. Global health has been a major focus of ours from the beginning. We work with national and regional uh, media outlets uh, but one of the most distinctive elements of our model is the partnerships we built with educational institutions, 35 uh, universities across the country and several hundred middle and secondary schools with the aim of using our journalism as the means of engagement with the big global issues that affect us all. Boston University was one of our earliest partners and one of our best. Uh, and also a leading example of the cross-disciplinary collaboration that we consider essential to effective engagement. The partnership, as Sandra said, is with both the School of Public Health and the College of Communications. Uh, it includes international reporting opportunities for a student from each school each year. The deadline for applications uh, for that this year is March 15th, so I hope students here uh, we'll look at our website or check with your uh, professors here uh, as to the requirements for that and that you'll apply. And if you have any questions, chase me down here. Over the past uh, eight years, we've worked with BU to tackle a series of tough, important topics. From the role of first responders, uh, public health workers and journalists uh, in natural disasters, to HIV AIDS, malaria, and climate change. 
We've seen the value of bringing together public policy experts and journalists learning from each other. I'm so grateful to Sandro and his colleagues for suggesting this year's topic, Death and Dying, and for recruiting such an extraordinary group, public health specialists, ethicists, and storytellers. This is an issue uh, that is characterized, in my view, by a great disconnect uh, between the universal experience we all share witnessing the deaths of our loved ones and contemplating our own mortality, and a reluctance to discuss honestly and publicly the policies and attitudes that too often have gotten in, way, in the way of ensuring the good death that we all no doubt seek. A year ago, about this time, my mother died a good death. 93 years old, in hospice at home, surrounded by family, and friends. What a contrast to some of the other deaths that I've experienced, and I'm sure many of you too, in sterile hospital rooms, buried in machines and tubes, alone at the end, and at enormous expense. We can do better, all of us. And what a privilege to have this day to hear from so many leaders in this field. So thank you all again, and I look forward to the talks to come. Thank you. Very good. Now, we're done with the formalities. Now we'll get to the interesting part. So the day is organized with three panels, and uh, we have asked a, um, a colleague to lead each of the panels, and um, the panelists will say a few words, and then there'll be a discussion. So my job really is going to be just to introduce the um, facilitator of the panel, and I will let them take it over. So our first panel, we have the privilege of having Sharon Begley with us uh, today, who will be leading this. Uh, Sharon is a senior science writer at STAT, which she has been since it started in 2015. Previously, she was the senior health and science correspondent at Reuters, science editor and science columnist at Newsweek, and a science columnist at the Wall Street Journal. She's written several books, most recently the book uh, Can't Just Stop, An Investigation of Compulsions. Um, uh, Sharon is a, is a lucid, clear writer. I've really enjoyed her writing for a long time. We're delighted to have her with us. Sharon. Thank you very much, um, Dean Galea, and let me add my welcome um, to those you've already heard. Um, it's terrific to see the room filled like this. Um, so welcome to Living, How We Think About Death, which, which actually should probably be amended to how we think or avoid thinking about death. Um, but wait, since it's 2019, um, there's an app for that. Um, yes, you can, but not now, because please turn off your phones. Um, but later, during the break, you can download We Croak, and you will get five reminders every day through pithy quotations and, and thoughtful ideas um, that, yes, as we heard, 100% chance that we are all going to die. Um, but there are many serious efforts to start the death conversation. Um, you can uh, go to the website of The Conversation Project um, and there get a starter kit um, for help discussing the end of life. Depending where you live, you can hang out at a death cafe, you can hire a death doula, or otherwise participate in what's called the positive death movement. Death, in other words, is trending. So we have five fantastic thinkers on our panel um, to kick off our death symposium. And let me invite them all to come take their chairs um, while I continue to drone on here. Um, so let me just um, start with the bad news. Um, Barbara Ehrenreich, um, the fant fantastic activist, author, um, journalist, essayist, is not able to join us today. Um, she is under the weather. Um, so I will pretend to be Barbara at the end and just talk for a couple of minutes about some of the points that she wanted to make. Um, however, we do have here, starting at my immediate left, um, Michael Hebb is a food provocateur and author. His second book published last year is Let's Talk About Death, which is just one of the things that brings him to our panel. Michael is the founder of deathoverdinner.org. Death Over Dinner is also his Twitter handle. Um, and that's a web platform that since its founding in 2013, I think, has facilitated more than 150,000 shared meals where people talk about death. 
Um, Michael also serves as a board advisor at the Friedman School of Nutrition Science and Policy at Tufts. In a previous life, he co-founded City Repair and Communitexture, and separately, Family Supper, a supper club in Portland that is credited with starting the pop-up restaurant movement. Next to Michael is Sally Tisdale. Sally is a registered nurse who, after earning her nursing degree, began to write in her spare time. I personally don't get nursing in spare time, but she managed to do it. Um, she published her first book about medical miracles in 1986 and a groundbreaking essay in Harper's about her work at an abortion clinic. She, she is the author of nine books, most recently, Advice for Future Corpses and Those Who Love Them, A Practical Perspective on Death and Dying. Her others include Talk Dirty to Me, Stepping Westward, and Women of the Way. Her work has appeared in Harper's, Antioch Review, Three Penny Review, The New Yorker, among other journals. Finally, Daniel Salmasi is the Andre Helliger's Professor of Biomedical Ethics at Georgetown University and the Acting Director of the University's Kennedy Institute of Ethics. His research interests include the ethics of end-of-life decision-making, ethics education, and spirituality in medicine, as well as the role of intention in medical action and the distinction between killing and allowing to die. He has written a number of books, including The Healer's Calling in 1997, A Bomb for Gilead in 2006, and Safe Passage, a global spiritual source book for care at the end of life. So you will see that we have a, a couple of empty seats. Um, Jamila Michener, um, who is an, an assistant professor of government at Cornell, is with us remotely. Um, the weather prevented her from being here in person, but through the magic of technology, we are confident that she will be able to at least give her um, opening re remarks, and we think we might even have her slides. So we'll cross our fingers that that works, um, and she'll participate as much as she can given the technological limitations. But um, Jamila's research focuses on poverty, racial inequality, and public policy topics she explored in her most recent book, Fragmented Democracy, Medicaid, Federalism, and Unequal Politics, which examines how Medicaid affects democratic citizenship. Jamila has written for many publications, including the New York Times, the Washington Post, Vox, Salon, and the American Prospect. She also co-leads the Finger Lakes chapter of the Scholars Strategy Network, which strives to bring academic research to policymakers, civil associations, and the media. So as um, Dean Galea explained, um, the format is fairly simple. I'm going to ask each of our panelists, present and remote in turn, um, to offer some thoughts for 10 or so minutes. Um, then after they have all spoken, I'll moderate a discussion um, amongst all of them. Um, and then of course, we'll open it up for audience um, Q&A and there will be microphones for that. So let us start please um, with Daniel. Thanks uh, to everyone for coming here. Thanks for the very gracious uh, introductions. Um, uh, I'm uh, going to start uh, as a physician and a philosopher more um, with a sort of philosophical grounding that I hope will be um, a, a good start for the, uh, for the day. Um, because I want to talk about death, um, dying, suffering, and meaning. Um, big questions, obviously. Um, but I think they're at the root of what this conference professes uh, to be about. Um, each has been discussed for millennia, um, but obviously all I can do in a brief time is maybe try to give you a few categories uh, that will uh, sharpen our uh, conversation and help us better understand what we're talking about when we talk about death, dying, suffering, and what they mean. Um, death. Um, is the ultimate manifestation of human finitude. From a purely philosophical point of view, death means non-existence, the ceasing to be of what was once a member of a biological natural kind. Now it's become common, and you've already heard it, and I don't mean to be uh, offensive, more to be provocative, to hear people say that death is a part of life, and while this phrase has a certain cachet and is intended, I'm sure, to be comforting, as plainly stated, in my view, the proposition is false. Death is no part of life. 
death and life are radically discontinuous. What does not exist is not a part of anything. Death is not a part of life. By contrast, dying is always a part of life. Life is a continuous act of defying, if you will, the third law of thermodynamics, the law of entropy. Life, in a real sense, contains within it the seeds of death. Whatever is living is also simultaneously dying. Um, it is dying, then, and not death that's a part of life. And dying, like the life against which it is always phenomenologically opposed, can be parsed into seven senses. And I think this may um, help particularly the epidemiologists um, in, the, in the room. Um, I call these senses of the word uh, dying the hours um, of our dying, uh, deliberately playing on the words of the old Catholic prayer. These hours are at once temporal and existential. Each refers to a potential event in time as well as to a set of personal, social, moral, medical, and ontological realities. And I'm going to go through them quickly, um, given the time restraints. The first is metaphysical dying. It refers to the dying that's present in every instant of every instance of life, based on the understanding that life is finite. The second is functional dying. And that refers to the various permanent losses or failures of development of those capacities that are typical of us as human beings as the biological kinds of things that we are. Now, medicine can reverse some of these functional losses, but not others. I'm an internist. I can cure pneumonia, but I can't cure congestive heart failure, um, and I can't cure an amputation. Third. By inevitable dying, I mean that certain biological states can aptly be described as chronic, disabling, eventually fatal conditions. Thus, a person can be said to be dying of emphysema. And one of the great achievements, I think, of contemporary medicine has been to turn diseases that used to kill people quickly into d diseases of which they will inevitably uh, die. Once the disease is determined to be chronic and disabling, barring uh, other intervening fatal events, it will result eventually in an empirical death, even if that takes years or even decades. Fourth, by inexorable dying, I mean that a person has entered a phase in which the final trajectory towards death is clear, and death can be anticipated in a matter of a few months or even just weeks. Cancers, certain neurological conditions, and other untreatable infections give rise to the hour of our inexorable dying. Fifth, imminent dying describes that point at which it becomes evident that death will ensue in days. Colloquially, one hears people say that the body is shutting down. Such persons are typically bedridden, losing appetite, and if they're awake, they're beginning to lose consciousness. Sixth, by the active hour of our dying, I mean that the person is in the throes of death, that empirical death is expected to take place within minutes or hours. And finally, by empirical death, I mean simply that an individual permanently has ceased to exist as a unified biological organism of a particular natural kind. Now, these seven hours, as I call them, admittedly are primarily biomedical characterizations. But for us as human beings, each carries with it a unique set of psychological, social, and spiritual dimensions as well. Like Kubler-Ross's stages of dying, these hours of dying are not to be interpreted rigidly. Um, to avoid misinterpretation, I've deliberately avoided using words like phases or stages. Different diseases take patients on different trajectories through the hours of their dying. Some are bypassed altogether. A cancer patient might experience every hour of dying. A child struck by lightning might only experience metaphysical and empirical dying. Yet the strengths, I think, of parsing dying into these hours is that they are relevant across different classes of disease, 
clarify what we might mean when we talk about care for the dying, and connect dying to all the phases of our life so that the sharp distinction between the living and the dying loses much of its prejudicial force. Now these distinctions between death and dying and my parsing of dying into these seven hours allows me to say that literally, and again, I don't mean to be offensive, but to be provocative, but in my view, there is no such thing as a good death. Please don't understand me. Death may be for the best, but it's never good. We lose someone when death occurs, and that person loses any physical relationship with the rest of us. Death is always a loss, and to say anything less, I think, is facile, glib, and in the end makes a mockery of our grief. Dyings, by contrast, can be better or worse, Families, friends, and healthcare professionals can make dying go better or go worse. And the hours of our dying are interconnected. How a person has lived in the face of any of the previous hours of dying will have a lot to say, a lot to do with how that person faces the next hour of dying. And how we face the hours of our dying is deeply related to the question of suffering. Suffering, in its broadest sense, is a state in which an individual member of an animal natural kind confronts its finitude. There need be no immediate existential threat. There need be no pain. Whether an in, whenever an individual confronts limitation, the experience can become an occasion of suffering. In human experience, this explanation helps us to distinguish pain from suffering. Right? Pain hurts, but not all pain is suffering. Osteoarthritis, for example, causes joint pain, but that pain does not become suffering until it occasions a confrontation with finitude, as in the moment one is prevented from opening a jar or getting out of a car with ease. There can also be profound suffering in the absence of any painful sensation. A depressed person suffers terribly, but depression is not a painful sensation. A depressed elderly man faces the limits of his human appetite, his capacity for self-esteem, his ability to engage in pleasurable activities, enjoy a normal light night's sleep, or even to persist in being. This is a state of suffering even in the absence of any physical pain. It's the confrontation with finitude that is at the root of suffering, because finitude is always in tension with our intrinsic value. We intuit that what is of intrinsic value ought to perdure. Why something like a human being, something like us, with such great intrinsic value should perish is at the root of suffering. Suffering, then, is an existential state. It's not a sensation, a perception, an emotion, or a thought. Suffering takes place when an animal confronts its finitude. And that is the state that's intrinsic to all animal life, including human life. There are no suffering receptors in your brains. Sensations, perceptions, emotions, and thoughts can each be occasions of suffering. Sensations, perceptions, emotions, and thoughts can each accompany suffering and modulate how an individual reacts to suffering, but they are not what suffering is. Suffering itself is the individual's confrontation with finitude. And since humans are complex, human suffering is more complex than that of any other animal. Human suffering is a confrontation with human finitude in all of its modes, intellectual, moral, and physical. Human suffering is typically holistic, afflicting us as human beings in the multiple dimensions of our being and affecting multiple capacities at once. And since the intrinsic value of the human is the special value we call dignity, the tension between human finitude and human dignity raises some of the most significant questions that can be raised in thinking about life and its significance. 
Why must I suffer? Why must my child die? How can I go on? In thinking about ethics and the spirituality of caring for those who are facing death, those are the questions that we cannot ignore. Because meaning is a fundamental question for us as human beings. Only creatures of our kind with a capacity for grasping the infinite can know what it means to be finite and to seek the meaning of our finitude. We naturally seek the meaning of death to avoid seeking the meaning of death or to avoid thinking about death altogether is thus, in my view, dehumanizing. But I think that's why we're gathered here today to avoid the dehumanizing avoidance of both death and its meaning. I look forward to our conversation and hope that these medico-philosophical musings uh, can help clarify what we're thinking about when we talk about death, dying, suffering, and meaning throughout the rest of the day. Thank you. Before I let Daniel go for this round, um, I'm glad you started us off on a philosophical note, and the, the, the distinction between dying and death is, of course, critical. Um, before, just in case we're in danger of losing the philosophical thread, let me just draw you out on one question um, that occurred to me um, at the end of your remarks, namely, um, do you think that people who, not, who confront, um, who re more than recognize, confront and, and deal with the reality of impending death, do they live their lives differently from people who are more avoidant? Um, yes, I, um, I, I think that they actually do. Um, I think they are in, um, um, in touch with the reality of what it means to be human, um, and, um, and that's necessary in order to um, live fully as a human being. Um, so um, you know, I think that um, people who, for instance, um, have been able through their lives to really understand um, what, um, uh, what suffering means um, and to um, um, find a way to, um, to cope with that, to go on, um, to even be generous towards others in the face of that um, are the kinds of people um, whose dyings can be extraordinarily instructive for the rest of us. Thank you. Next, Sally Tisdall. Hello. Um, I, I want to just briefly correct a little bit in my biography. Uh, I was always a writer, and I went to nursing school to pay the rent. And it turned out that I liked nursing. Um, and for quite some time, I have worked. I work in a palliative care system. I do work part time, but I work as a um, direct care nurse with dying people and a case manager. And I know I'm speaking mostly to a room of people more concerned with policy and population health. Um, but a lot of what I say about policy is comes from the perspective of being at that bedside. And today I'm going to talk about this idea of a good death, which is an intersection for these two things. This is what we hear, we hear a lot, this phrase, a good death, um, and I think it can play out in a very constricting and negative way. Um, it's one of those phrases that we can become fairly glib about. Um, it can actually hamper appropriate care and um, the dying process. So first I want to ask for a show of hands. Um, think for a few seconds about what you consider a good death. How many of you consider a good death is largely free of physical pain? How about peaceful? How about including family and friends? And lastly, the chance to reflect on your life. OK. So congratulations, because Every survey of attitudes toward death hit those four parts. That's what most people in the world who are surveyed about death say a good death is. 
Now, in the United States, we're lucky to have a, an official government definition of a good death. <laughs> oh, surely that's not a surprise. <laughs> It, it comes from uh, the Institute of Medicine that's now called the Health and Medicine Division of the National Academies. And this has to do with the fact that hospice certification is federally based and so on. So we have a, an official definition that goes like this. A good death is one free from avoidable distress and suffering for patients, families, and caregivers. In general accord with patients and families' wishes, and reasonably consistent with clinical, cultural, and ethical standards. And I, I read that and I can't imagine how many hours were spent crafting, <laughs> drafting every word in that definition. And I don't see how we can really avoid having this definition, but I can really argue with it. Um, and that's what I want to do right now is, uh, a lot of what we say when we talk about dying is fantasy. And this, I, this particular idea of what that good death looks like is a real fantasy. Starting with avoidable distress and suffering. How can we as a group decide what that is? It is only the person in the deathbed that knows what that means. What distress and suffering is at that moment is only defined by the person dying. So is avoidable. That's a very easy way for us to subtly coerce the person in bed. And I'll come back to that. Do you want to be free of pain if you're sleeping all the time? This is a choice many people end up having to make. How much pain will you tolerate in order to be awake? It's a question that needs to be asked long before the time arrives, but it's never ask in time, rarely. I ask. So is it avoidable? Yes. Is that what you want? Maybe. Is a good death peaceful? How do you define peace? Is it the same as the person sitting next to you? I think we have this idea, one of my favorite cartoons is grandpa in bed saying, these are my last words. No, wait, these are my last words. We have this fantasy that people are awake um, and that they're quiet and that they're saying I love you as they hold hands at the moment of death. As we were just, just reminded, most people are losing consciousness in the last days of life. Um, most people are not speaking at the time of death. Um, a certain amount of delirium, agitation, what's called terminal agitation and terminal restlessness is common. L heavy, noisy breathing is common. We don't see it as a, as a source of suffering, but it's not quiet. And also to follow up on what we were just told, you know, emotional anguish can be very quiet. A person can lie in bed completely peaceful looking and be suffering deeply. A person can be noisy and trying to climb out of bed and making um, grunting noises and be very peaceful and calm inside. Uh, so we have to drop this fantasy of the quiet deathbed. What I argue with most with this definition is this unapologetic inclusion of other people's experience that it's not just the patients, but the families and the caregivers who also need to avoid distress and suffering. Most definitions, most of our concepts of a good death are social at the core, but there's no more solitary activity that I can imagine than dying. No more individual experience unshared than that moment. So when we say good, a good death, for family and caregivers, we mean good for everyone present without, without adjusting to the fact that everybody's expecting something different. How many of you do sometimes spend time at the bedside of a dying person? How many of you have seen the family be totally on the same page, never splitting staff, never disagreeing, never acting out old scripts, and always in accord with the patient? Right. In one family, a good death means the person in bed is explicitly saying they're ready to go. In another family, 
they don't want the patient even to know that their, di their diagnosis, neither of which may have anything to do with what the patient wants. So to avoid the distress and suffering of a family may mean causing distress and suffering to a patient. And to avoid the distress and suffering of caregivers, I really argue with that. Um, we know there aren't enough caregivers out there. We know that most people are dying in the hands of people who are unlicensed and poorly educated and poorly trained to do the job they're doing. And of all things, it's one of the worst paid jobs in the United States. Should be one of the best. Should be a very well paid, well trained job and it's not. Um, so we're, we're asking caregivers to avoid distress, which means don't ask for anything. Don't ask for extras. Don't complain. Don't resist the care that I want to give you when it's time to give it. It means going along with a schedule. It means sharing a room with a stranger. There are so many ways that our ability to give care to the dying um, puts the interests of the caregiver against the interests of the patient. So all these expectations about a good death can become a subtle form of coercion. The family and the friends and the caregivers start to gently push against what the patient is asking for. Behave a certain way, say certain words, don't say other words. And lastly, I want to talk about how one of the witnesses to a death is the institution that surrounds it, whatever it is, whether it's a hospice system in the home, a nursing home, foster care home, the insurance company. These are all witnesses to the death. Um, a study of hospice's own definition of the good death concluded that a socially responsible individual quietly slips away once all that could be done is seen to have been done. In other words, it looks good. It looks good to the others. A hospice system has a vested interest in visibly good deaths. Caregivers tell these stories of good deaths in order to sell the system to the patient. It reassures families, it reassures caregivers that we are providing a good death. So it has to be a visibly good death. It has to fit this model. And people who die deaths that don't fit this model are problematic, and they are called case studies. They become the subject of articles. So what do we want instead of this elusive good death? I start with the illusion that we think we're in charge. We're not in charge of the fact that we die. The essence of dying is the loss of control. What we can choose is to turn toward that, not to fight the fact of it, even as we fight the experiences at times. It may be withdrawal for one person, curiosity for another, struggle for another. That depends on the person. We can make detailed plans and choices, but we can't choose not to die. So I like to talk about an appropriate death or a mastered death, and I'm not the first person to use these terms. A mastered death is one in which the person remains their whole self, their individual self, expressing themselves to the extent possible as long as possible. And an appropriate death can reflect the life lived, and it may not look at all like mine. So I'll end by saying, um, and I know we're going to have more of a conversation, but how we truly support the dying person has to do with letting go of our own need for control and our own expectations about what happens. Good medicine and good nursing includes not doing things. It's a hard lesson to learn, and it tends to be the more mature caregiver that gets it. It includes stopping what we're doing. It includes noticing that things aren't working. It's not about doing. Sometimes it's about not doing. We're not in charge. And this is true until the very last breath of life. Only the person in bed is dying. <laughs>
That's what I have to say today. So now that you've um, chucked out all of our hopes for a good death because it doesn't <laughs> exist, let me at least seize on the idea of a mastered death. Um, in practical terms, what if the dying person's idea of a mastered death, even if he or she is not using that terminology, um, conflicts with how the family members let me, let me stick to family members even more than caregivers, but feel free to address that as well. What do you do in your day-to-day -day practical work if there's a conflict there? I see it almost every day, actually. Um, one of the jobs I have is working as a discharge planner for people in our palliative care system. And if you work in palliative care, you know you don't want to be in the hospital. Um, most palliative care patients are in the hospital only for you know, an emergent comfort need, they break a hip, they have a pain crisis. So we wanna get them out of the hospital as fast as possible. Mo going into the hospital is when those family conflicts arise directly and they often, it, these are conversations that need to be had ahead of time. So when it, you know, unfortunately, they don't always happen in time. So. For me, a lot of it has to do with normalizing what's happening. To the extent that I can say to the family member, I've seen this before, this looks all right, this is what I'm seeing, this is why we're seeing this, um, just to continually normalize the process of dying itself. Most people have never seen anybody die. And you only lose your mother once, you only lose your father once. So we, we're not trained, we can't learn how to lose our mothers. So I think remembering that everybody's a beginner in that room and that what I can do is, is witness what is normal and what can be done and what can't be done, that can help. So again, it's about that fantasy. What's really happening and what do we expect? Thank you so much. Um, next, Michael Hebb. I think this is on, yeah, it is, okay, great. Um, so we've had we've heard about philosophy and we've heard a bit about the practical. Um, I want us to actually ground it into individual for a moment. Um, if you'll indulge me for just a, this will be very brief, but I ask that we all just close our eyes for a second and take a deep breath from our belly, let it out, and then I want you to think about somebody with your eyes still closed who you've lost. Um, someone who had a powerful impact on your life. Um, I want you to bring up the, you know, the image of their face or just something that reminds you of them. Um, I want you to open your eyes. Um, and just in your own mind, say their name. Okay, and then I'd ask that at some point today, um, whether it's while we're all together or after you go home or... Um, you know, driving in the snow <laughs> and you want to use your Bluetooth, um, go ahead and have a conversation with somebody today and talk about this person. Just bring them into your presence, into your being. Because um, that's why we're here. It's not just the statistics. It's because it connects to all of us so personally. Um, I lost my father um, when I was 13. Um, and he was diagnosed with Alzheimer's when I was in second grade. Um, and this was um, quite a, it was a while ago, Alzheimer's was still an unknown thing and it completely destroyed my family, just tore us apart. One of the things that it was very noticeable um, was that we stopped eating together as a family. My father got sick and he was institutionalized um, into, um, you know, into a care home. Um, and, f and, and that seemed to me like kind of a failure of the family, that we didn't come together around the din dining room table. The thing is, my mother and my brother, they didn't have the skills to have this conversation. And so the most healthy place we could be was away from each other, quite frankly. Um, so I spent a lot of time um, as a child, um, you know, dinner looked a lot like um, cereal in front of a Nintendo, and that felt like pretty good, um, <laughs> quite frankly. Um, and then, um, when I was 17, I moved in with my sister, um, who was quite a bit older. Um, she's in the room, actually. Um, and she had a family of her own. She's my half-sister. 
And she would go to the market almost every day, um, very kind of Alice Waters-esque. And, um, and she would shop and she'd buy incredible food, um, go to the farmer's market, buy a bottle of wine, and she would spend the afternoon cooking most afternoons. And I'd sit at the, um, you know, up at the kitchen counter and I'd watch her cook. And f for one, I was just fascinated. Like, I was like, what is this thing she's doing called cooking, right? <laughs> Um, and then we would sit down, another revolutionary idea, we'd sit down as a family, we'd crack open a bottle of wine, and we would share stories about our day. Um, and that, for me, was completely different um, than m my childhood experience. And so, not only, you know, what I've come to realize is not only have we forgotten how um, to talk about dying, not only are we not often in the presence of somebody who's dying or even encountered a dead body, We've also forgotten how to eat together. Um, Michael Pollan um, so keenly pointed out that 20% of American meals are eaten in the car, um, right? And that was before Netflix. Um, when, you know, so like, how many meals are eaten while watching Netflix in bed? Um, how many meals are eaten at your desk? Like, it's a big number, and that's not. I'm not shaming anybody because I love watching Netflix in bed and eating. It's totally fine. Um, but I came to realize from not having something and then getting it again um, with this idea of cooking together, eating together, communicating as a family, healing as a family, um, knowing your family history, just the person that I had you bring to mind is one of the number one indicators of your own personal well-being and your resilience, your actual, like, your public health to some extent, is knowing your family history. Um, so family history it is also knowing about people that have died, this kind of oscillating na narrative, they call it. It's been good, it's been bad, people have died, we've survived as a family. It's a very key indicator within a family about how well um, that family will be resilient to, um, to disease. So nonetheless, I'd, um, I got this back. I was like, okay, um, eating together is very important. Um, and how, and we've forgotten how to do it. So what am, I'm going to spend the rest of my life um, choosing the table as my medium. This was my like, you know, 19 year old self, right? I was like, so I'm, I felt like an artist, um, kind of felt like I had the soul of an artist. And so I decided that my medium was going to be the table. Um, and then I had the like uh, very disquieting moment when I was like, who else out there has the medium as, you know, who else is using the table as the medium? And it was crickets, right? You know, it's like, I'm a sculptor, I'm a writer, you know, I'm a painter. And it's like, but, but what about the table? And, um, and, there, and there was no one. Uh, so, but I was like, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to spend my life understanding how the table works, how I can reinvigorate how we eat together. And, you know, I went way back in history and understood how important um, the symposiums were to um, ancient Greek culture, right? And that's actually not just some idea on a Senate floor got us democracy or the idea of the justice system. It actually happened at dinner, right? Um, the Seder is actually what keep, kept a lot of the Jewish um, tradition together, this idea of taking um, the ritual out of the temple and putting it at the table on an annual basis. Um, right? You, we talk about what happened in Paris with Gertrude Stein and her salons. and So all of these things were happening with the table. So I was like, I'm going to go out and have as many conversations around the dinner table as possible. Um, and so I did. Um, and it took me all over the world and I brought together presidents and Nobel Prize winners and talked about genocide and homelessness and talked about every difficult issue I possibly could to see if I could change policy. The thing that I realized was I was never going to be able to scale that, right? I was only going to be able to be as impactful as I could be with the number of people I could gather around a table. And the problem with the table is the more people that you put at it, the less impactful it is, right? A table of four, five, six, seven, that's where people's hearts open and things really transform. And so this is where death came in. Um, so it's like, how do I scale this thing called the dinner table? Um, and I noticed along the way, I'd done this for 20 years, gathering people and really challenging them at the dinner table, and I realized that every time I talked about the most difficult topics, the taboos, um, about sex, um, about addiction, about death, when I crossed over into this territory um, that people have a hard time talking about, these different territories, a couple things happened. 
Um, people got to know themselves better. Um, they said things that surprised them about themselves, right? They didn't go through the script. Um, they actually learned something. And self-knowledge is another great indicator around health and well-being, right? The other thing that happened, especially with conversations about death, was that people connected faster and more deeply than I've ever seen them connect before um, on any other topic. It was just like peculiar. How is this thing that we avoid more than any other topic the best medicine for human connection and self-knowledge? And so it was kind of a paradox for me. Um, and so I decided that um, I'm going to combine these two things that I've, have been so central in my life, um, both death um, and uh, the table, and figure out how to put them in, like almost make a board game out of it. So, let's, so that's what death over dinner is, and we can talk about it. Extended. And it has scaled, and there's been over a million people um, who have now sat down and had these conversations. And we did it, we created it as a gift. Um, a couple of things before we um, turn into just conversation, but things that might not get said otherwise today is, um, yes, um, it is a great way to reduce um, the healthcare costs at the end of life is to have these conversations. There's no question about it. You want to tell your loved ones, um, how to honor you, um, what you want, um, for a lot of reasons. It'll probably cost less than the default, for sure, but it also will reduce their length of grief if they know how to honor you. It's one of the most thoughtful, compassionate things you can do for your loved ones is make sure they know how to honor you, because it has been you know, proven in studies that it reduces the time that they grieve. Um, the other thing is repression, the things that we hold down, actually creates a perfect environment for disease, right? So going and talking about all the scary stuff um, will actually make you live longer. And then there's the kind of fun things, like it has been proven, there was a study at Vassar that talking about death um, makes you funnier, um, <laughs> it makes you laugh more, um, and uh, incredible work being done by um, a few people, but also Dr. Jordana Jacobs around the fact that talking about and facing death can improve our intimate relationships, make our sex better, um, and, uh, and increase our capacity to love. So you've got this, like, it's going to make you funnier, sexier, live longer thing to bake into the rest of the statistics we're going to talk about today. So in other words, you guys are all going to have a great evening <laughs> after this. Um, Michael, you have made the point, I can't remember if it was in uh, something that you've written or maybe I saw it in one of your talks, um, that in fact people do think about death and talk about death but in their own heads. Um, and I wonder if you could just elaborate on that in particular whether, okay, so there's a conversation that's happening within the skull. When people attend, go to the um, death over dinner dinners, um, do they find that what they eventually articulate um, is different from what they've been saying in their heads? Hmm. That's a good question. Well, let me um, make that distinction really quick just so people know that, um, what you're referring to. We have a culture in, in a lot of ways, um, maybe not, maybe I think we've exported or maybe it's just an international phenomenon, but we like to blame people um, and say, you know, my spouse um, won't have the conversation, my parents aren't comfortable with having the conversation, um, it's, there's a lot of finger pointing, I tried, et cetera, um, they don't, they won't talk or they don't even think about this. Um, well, what I'd like to offer people is and in, in, invite them to shift that, um, that frame, that lens, and say, come on now. Everybody knows they're going to die, as the dean very clearly told us this morning as a reminder. Um, everybody is having a conversation about the fact that they're going to die in their own head. I promise you, it's happening. They might not be sharing it with you, right? So the, the question is, not how do they need to change, but how do I need to change? What do I need to shift in my interactions, um, in the space that I create for people, so they share that already happening conversation with me? You know, if I'm committed to hearing what that conversation is, um, like if I was as committed to hearing it as I was to getting a job, 
um, which if you, you know, people that have jobs know that there's going to be rejection. Um, there's going to, it's going to take tenacity. Um, it's going to take all of these things or like courtship. Like if it was like courtship, it takes all of your resources to have somebody fall in love with you, right? If you want to have a conversation with someone in your life about what they want at the end, you can have it if you really open yourself up to it, I think. I mean, some people, sure, it's going to be very, very difficult. So as far as do people get out of the script that's in their head or the conversation that's in their head, I think, yeah, there's, um, well, two things. They do start sharing what they have been, their preoccupations, because very few people have actually invited them to talk openly in a safe environment without a, um, uh, having a specific goal-oriented conversation. Goal-oriented conversations can be um, a little bit triggering, or especially around these type of topics. So if we're just stretching out into an evening where it's not about specifically getting an advanced care directive done or a living will, but just hearing each other as humans, then yeah, you start to hear the contents of somebody's brain in a way that you wouldn't otherwise. Um, and, but the other thing I do want to point is having, creating opportunities where we surprise ourselves and we're surprised by our loved ones. I have never done a death dinner where I haven't heard a spouse say, you've never heard this before or I've never heard you say that before. And I've done a lot of dinners. It happens every time. So. So now we are going to hope that um, technology comes through um, and that we can hear uh, Jamila Michener um, of Cornell. So take it away if you can. Jamila, are you there? Hello. Yes, I'm here. Can everyone hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you so much for um, doing this. We're sorry you can't be with us in person, but you are coming through loud and clear, so the floor is yours. Okay, excellent. I, I've also been hearing all of you, and it's been wonderful to be able to um, not... It's, it's not wonderful that I'm not able to be there, but it's been wonderful to be able to uh, hear the sort of wisdom and insights of the folks who have presented already. And if Yes, we, we, you, we, you cut off just when yeah. um, you were starting out, so maybe take it from yeah. near the top. Okay, I'll try again. It's funny, I've been listening the whole time and everything has been working perfectly, so of course just as I start talking I cut off. Um, okay, so I want to focus on uh, death, dying, and inequality. I have some slides, I'm not sure if you'll be able to see them, but I'll, I'll say the same thing pretty much irrespective of the slides. Uh, so, you know, in part, my focus on inequality comes from the fact that that's what I do. I study poverty and racial inequality and health policy. And so when I think about issues related to health and living and dying, I tend to think about them through the lens of inequality. Uh, but on a, a another reason why, <clears throat> when I heard this, theme for the conference, um, and I knew that the focus was going to be around death and dying, I decided that the thing that I wanted to think about and talk about with you all was inequality was because my own, you know, sort of most recent kind of experiences that have brought me closest to death have been marked by a sense of the deep disparities um, that that sort of characterize death, and I would say even dying um, in the United States specifically. So, you know, I'll give you two examples. One is involves my mom when I when I first moved to Ithaca, upstate New York, which we're currently in the middle of a blizzard, hence why I'm not there. Um, about five years ago, just a few months after I started my job at Cornell. 
my mom came to visit me. She lived in New York City, which is where I grew up. And I knew instantly when I saw her that something was wrong. I had only seen her probably two months prior to that. And in that two-month span, she looked really different. She had lost a lot of weight. And I said, something's wrong. And she said, no, I went to the doctor. And they said that, you know, I just have acid reflux. Everything's fine. And I didn't believe her. I thought that something was wrong. So I made an appointment for her to see a doctor in upstate New York. She had seen a doctor in New York City um, in a neighborhood in Queens, which is where I grew up. And it was a low-income neighborhood, a neighborhood populated primarily by African-American and Latino folks. And she went to the doctor. She had been losing a ton of weight. And the doctor said, you're fine. It's acid reflux without doing any tests are probing any further. She comes to see me. We're in upstate New York, a pr predominantly white community. And she goes to the doctor, um, and they ask her lots of questions, and they run lots of tests, and they take their time, and they're careful, and they're attentive. And within two days, she's diagnosed with stage 3 pancreatic cancer. Um, and at that time, her oncologist who was in Ithaca said to me, this isn't good. The prognosis isn't good. Uh, I see lots of pancreatic patients and generally, you know, this kind of thing resolves itself in death. And given where she is, I would say three months to a year and a year would be generous. So you might want to focus on getting your affairs in order. And actually at that point I had um, lots of great conversations with my mother about what she wanted and about her death and dying, uh, which seemed imminent at the time. She decided to stay with me in Ithaca. And the reason she decided to stay with me in Ithaca when she was getting her care had to do a lot with inequality. She said, you know, if I go back to New York City, I'm just another number in a poor neighborhood, some black lady experiencing pain, and nobody pays attention to me, which is what happened last time I went to the doctor. And they said I had acid reflux when I actually had pancreatic cancer. And she did not want to be that. She wanted to be somewhere where she said, you know, my, my, my brother would joke with me and say, I'm so glad that mom is staying up there to get her care. You know, the closer you are, the more proximate you are to white people, the better your, your health care is going to be. And maybe she won't die. And I didn't think that, um, but it turned out that my mother didn't die. Um, in part, she just responded in a really dramatically and surprising, uh, in a really dramatic and surprising fashion to what was supposed to just be palliative uh, chemotherapy, and her tumor ended up shrinking to the point where it was undetectable. And this is over five years later, and she's still alive. Um, and my, my brother always jokes um, that she lived because she fled where all the black people were and went to where the white folks were and was actually able to get care um, for which people were attentive to her. Now, this isn't, I, it's not true per se. I think there are a lot of reasons, most of which are idiosyncratic, that explain why my mother didn't die of her pancreatic cancer at that time. But the experience of dying wasn't something that she wanted to do in the place that she lived at the time. I remember talking through with her when she was trying to decide whether to stay in Ithaca with me or go back to New York City, the pros and cons. And a lot of the cons had to do with inequality. And she said, well, when I'm really sick and I have to get to the hospital, I don't have a car. I live in a place that's far from the nearest care center that's high quality, the process of getting there, the, the challenges around paying for that transportation, there were just race and class inequalities baked into her calculus of where she wanted to be as she was doing what she thought at the time was dying. So, you know, this is just one example, uh, but it's an example that taps into my research more broadly. So, you know, I, I look at Medicaid a lot in my work. And I think about geographic, racial, class-based inequalities in people's experiences with that program. And 
some of the conversations that I've been able to have with folks, especially since my recent book was published, have been really startling around inequalities that Medicaid beneficiaries experience in depth. Just recently, I talked to someone who told me the story of a mother um, whose 10-year-old son, who was a Medicaid beneficiary, uh, could not get access to um, the pain medication that he needed in the last days of his life in order to die comfortably. And in the conversation that I had about this, uh, the woman that I was speaking to pointed out, you know, these things really only happen to poor people, right? Now, I don't know how true that is, um, but I do know that there are lots of challenges that are really specific um, to people who are economically and racially marginalized when it comes to death and dying. So I thought I'd just give a few concrete examples. And I mean, the overarching point that I want to make is that, you know, in many cases, I, I like the point that we started the conference out with, which is, you know, that there's a 100% chance that we're all going to die. So, you know, death is natural. And dying, um, I mean, death may not be a part of life, but it's the way that it ends for everyone. Um, and dying is indeed a part of life. So those things happen. Um, and so it's easy for us to sort of uh, naturalize and sometimes homogenize the kind of end result of death and the process of dying because they, they are something that we all have in common, right? But I want to sort of push back against the instinct, the potential instinct, uh, to homogenize uh, death and dying. Because, in fact, they're really different um, depending on where you're located, where you're positioned with respect to race and class and gender, and in ways that really matter, um, and in ways that affect the extent to which the time that you die and the way that you die are, in fact, anything approximating what we might consider natural, right? Um, so just a few Examples. I don't know if the slide is up, but the, if the slides are up. But the very first slide um, on the on the PowerPoint that I have is just a slide that reflects uh, uh, mortality statistics around race, gender, um, for very recently, 2016 and 2017. And I want to let you know that you know, we, do, we, we do see your slide, so it's all working. Okay. Great. Thank you. So if we just think about what this slide reflects, which is age-adjusted uh, mortality rates, and we look at that across categories of race and gender, it's really clear that, you know, these things are, the, the death, right, um, has a certain amount of heterogeneity in terms of um, who is dying and at what rate, right? So black men are sort of far and away um, dying at the sort of highest rate, and they are followed by white men. Um, and if we look within gender, then we always see uh, racial disparities, right? So if we compare men, black men, are dying at the highest rates. If we if we look at women, um, then we see that um, black women are actually um, dying at lower rates than um, are, are slightly higher rates rather than white women. Um, and if we look at um, Hispanic women, it's really interesting because they're the the least they have the lowest death rates. So there are all sorts of reasons for these particular uh, forms of variation that we see here, which, of course, I do not have the time to delve deeply into. But the broad point um, that, that these population-level racial differences suggest factors and processes that aren't just about sort of natural, whatever that may mean, rates of death, but that are about... Um, social, economic, and I would argue even political in the sense that they're related to public policy realities, right? So the next slide, and I'll go more quickly through the slides, and I only have a few. The next slide 
um, looks at infant mortality and race. Um, and this is something that is probably not new to many of the people in the room, considering the crowd. Um, but if we look at infant mortality, then we see that in particular, um, non-Hispanic blacks and um, Native American and an Alaska, Alaska Native uh, are sort of highest with respect to this metric of infant mortality, right? If we look at the next slide, which is maternal mortality, which is something that's been very much, I think, in in the kind of public consciousness in the last year or so, in a way that it wasn't before, um, similar pattern where the highest rates of maternal mortality are for black women um, and one of the things that's been I think most productive about the dialogue around this in the last year um, is that it's pointed out some of the kind of systemic, uh, both systemic in terms of the healthcare system and systemic in terms of sort of society-wide implicit and explicit forms of of racism that has helped us understand where some of these numbers come from, although there's still a lot to understand. The next slide just looks at disease and race and so the things that are um, causing a lot of death and thinking about racial disparities and those things and I mean there's a lot going on here but one of the big takeaways is just to pay attention to that Um, I mean there are various um, various forms of blue but very often the the blue bar for um, for blacks, for African Americans, is highest, right? For heart disease, for cancer, etc. Um, and then the next slide, uh, which is a little bit outside of the direct realm of sort of health, health, but certainly within the realm of public health, if we think about deaths due to uh, what the scholars who came up with this graph called legal intervention, um, but it's and they also say police enforcement, um, but this is young males between the ages of 15 and th- or 30 and 34 who are killed by police, right? Um, <clears throat> and if we look at racial variation in terms of those kinds of deaths, uh, they're also um, uh, rather in income variation as well. Um, it's rather marked here. I'll move to the next slide, uh, which is focused on guns, violence, death and race, and we see that whether we think about um, homicides, right, or firearm-related deaths, um, and we look at the sort of age groups where we see a lot of that sort of activity going on, we can look at this over time, or we can look at it in a cross-section just for 2016, but there's there are really sharp uh, racial distinctions in terms of who is being killed, Um and who is involved in a firearm-related death, right? And then this last slide is just, or it's not the last slide, the second to last slide is focused on death and income. And this is some data uh, that actually focuses on um, the relationship between um, death rates and incomes. And so as, you know, higher death rates are associated with lower incomes. So for each of these slides, there are there's an entire lengthy, detailed conversations to be had, right? And so it's not as though we can explain these things in one fell swoop or paint with too broad of a brush. But I would say um, two things in sort of closing. One is that um, the disparities reflected on each of these slides Um, point to social and economic and political processes as part of the explanatory factors that help us to sort of grasp what's going on, right? Um, And so it's important to think about not just inequality and death, uh, but the ways in which those inequalities are generated by us, by what we're doing um, as a society and as a polity, Um, they're generated on a sort of societal level and then born on a community level by particular racial groups, particular um, groups of people. 
who have to sort of deal with the consequences of the choices that we're that we're all making as a society. And then the, the last point that I'll make, because I'm a political scientist, and this is a point that's important to me, and this is the last slide reflected on the last slide, is that all of these inequalities have consequences for democracy. And we may not think of that all of the time. It may not sort of be top of our minds. But there's really great research by a political scientist named Javier Rodriguez. And one of the things that Professor Rodriguez focuses on is on the sort of, for for a variety of reasons, mortality differences between racial groups. And what those mortality differences essentially amount to in terms of lost political voice. Because once you're dead, whether it's because of homicide or a, a firearm or you know, being killed by a police officer or heart disease or you've died before, during or after childbirth or you die as a child, as an infant, all of the variety of of, um, sort of reasons for death and ways of dying that are marked by deep racial and class inequalities mean that you're gone. You're no longer a part of the political community. You don't have a political voice. You're not voting you're not able to exert an influence that you might otherwise exert. So when these inequalities operate on a kind of population um, level this way, it means that entire groups of the chunks of certain populations are just missing, right? They're missing because they're gone, they're dead. Um, And that means that has implications for political voice and for inequalities in political voice and those inequalities in political voice actually feed back into a lot of the policy issues that lead to the population inequalities in death as well, right? So these, all of these issues are sort of linked and they implicate democracy, implicate public health, and implicate death um, in ways that I think are complex but worth thinking closely about. I'll stop there. Jamila, if I can keep you for another few minutes. Um, I I wondered about extending your points about health and health care inequalities, you know, the the death rates, um, rates of disease, et cetera, into the how of death. In other words, um, what does research show about whether people who are are on Medicaid or who are a disadvantaged minority, et cetera, are their deaths and I won't say less likely to be a good death because we've heard that there's no such thing, um, but are they um, treated differently within um, the palliative care system, at hospice, or wherever they might be um, ending their life? Do we know anything about that? Yeah, so I'll say, so first I'll confess that, that I'm not an expert on that, um, but even not, not being an expert, so <clears throat> I'll answer in two ways. One is the part of that that I, that I am an expert on, which is uh, just the, the sort of access to care for Medicaid beneficiaries in particular. And, you know, when we think about Medicaid beneficiaries, they're really the kind of at, at the crux of a lot of the different kinds of inequalities that I pointed out. Um, roughly 50 percent of beneficiaries are people of color. Um, the vast majority of them are, are folks who are living in our near poverty. So. You know, if we think about beneficiaries, we know that their access to, for example, hospice care um, is really varied. And it's varied not in ways that are connected to needs or in ways that are like sort of principled or that have to do with the very thoughtful, um, you know, ideas that we've already heard expressed in this conference. But they're varied because of policy. And so, you know, Hospice care for Medicaid beneficiaries is at the discretion of states, right? And this is really a lot of the focus of my last book is how much power states and localities have to determine what kinds of care you have access to. And one of the things that states can decide is what sorts of things they cover with respect to hospice care and what sorts of things they cover with respect to end-of-life care um, and even the kind of um, sort of access that you get when you're facing any kind of chronic or life-threatening illness. And there's 
tremendous variation in that regard. And so one of the things that I point out in the book is whether you can get access to hospice care at all as a poor adult um, is going to vary based on what state you live in. There are some states where you just you, you won't be able to get that at all. You just will have to die however you die without whatever else you might have preferred or wanted um, on account of nothing more than you happen to live in Alabama or what have you. And so that's one aspect of, you know, the kind of process that's very much rooted in public policy and very much characterized by deep and I think arbitrary inequalities. Um, now, the other part of it that comes to mind for me, which is the part that I'm less of an expert on, is the part that's focused on the actual nature of um, the care you get vis-a-vis -vis things like the responsiveness of doctors, et cetera. So I know, um, and a lot of this is from research I've done on account of my own personal experiences as a black woman, um, and so those experiences have prompted me to do research, and this is how I've learned a lot of this because it doesn't necessarily fall within my um, my typical wheelhouse, that there you know, are many studies, numerous studies, that point out, for example, the ways that doctors are less responsive to uh, the pain of African Americans and the ways that um, even when all of the policies are in place, for allowing an, a person to have um, access to health care and to have um, access to the kinds of things that, will, that might allow you uh, to have a process, a dying process, um, that is easier rather than harder, even when those things are in place on a kind of resource level, um, they rely on interpersonal interactions between nurses, between doctors, between care providers, and individuals, and when those individuals are, for example, um, African American, uh, the 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 extent to which those interactions will lead to uh, folks getting um, what they need and or want in the process of dying uh, varies in really systematic ways. So, you know, the story isn't especially positive, even when we pivot from sort of policy. To thinking about some of the interpersonal particularities. Great, thank you so much. Um, so in the time that we have left before the break, I want to do two things. Um, I want to read just a snippet of what Barbara Ehrenreich was going to say, and then I'm going to uh, throw it open to audience questions. So while I'm pretending to be Barbara, um, you all can think what you would like to ask. Certainly any of our three panelists here, if Jam Jamila is able to stay on the phone, she is in the mix as well. So from Barbara, I am 77 years old and I love cheeseburgers and Popeye's fried chicken. I exercise when I feel like it and I refuse to submit to the medical tests and screenings that are recommended for all people over 50. No mammograms, no colonoscopies, no bone density screenings. This makes me an outlier because our culture expects or demands that anyone over a certain age will spend a significant amount of their time trying to prolong their lives, keeping up with the latest dietary fads, following a rigid exercise regimen, obsessing about blood pressure and cholesterol levels, meditating. The assumption is that we can control our bodies and thus extend our lives almost indefinitely. This assumption carries with it profound implications for how we think about death and dying. If you do not live, at least until your 90s, if you fail to age successfully, if you develop chronic diseases and disabilities, you must be doing something wrong. Your health is entirely up to you, and death is seen increasingly as a mark of failure. When someone dies, we submit them to a kind of moral auto autopsy. Did they smoke? Did they drink to excess? Did they fail to follow the latest dietary recommendations? Did they not eat enough kale? <laughs> In a culture that insists that we can control our own health and lifespan, every death begins to seem like a suicide. How has this changed how we talk about death? So um, 
If there are any questions, Meredith, we have a handheld mic that will be brought around to you. Just wave your hand and I'll try to recognize you. Hi. <laughs> yes, sorry. <laughs> so I actually have an observation about what I've been noticing in the conversation about death today is that we talk about it as if the death that we experience is our own. And you made the point in the beginning that death is not a part of our life. It's a part of the life of the people we leave behind who care about us. And I feel like one of the things that isn't really being addressed as much is the discussion needs to happen between people. Because while I totally agree that people are talking about death in their head all the time, I think it's leading to people coming up with fantasies of their death with totally unrealistic expectations fed by the idea of a good death. And as an example, my father, when we had a discussion with him about what he wanted done after he died, explained that his body needed to be saved to be shot from a cannon of the first <laughs> naval volley of the next world war, as if that was like an option. <laughs> and it sounds really, really funny until your dad, your mom, and your brother die in a car accident together, and you now have three bodies, and you have no idea where any of them are going because they wouldn't plan anything. And for me, I think a big part of why the conversations need to happen is because it's not just the family members that are sitting around or the caregivers that are there or the person in the bed. It's all of them together. And if we don't develop a language and words to talk about the things that we're experiencing, we totally increase the suffering on the people we leave behind with the fantasies of what we want. And I just wanted to kind of bring that up as like, I feel like we're missing the idea of whose deaths we deal with and the impact of the kind of selfishness that I see that's starting to happen around the idea of planning our deaths in the same way that we plan our weddings. I don't know if anybody has feedback for that, but I just wanted to kind of put that in early in the day. Yes, thank you. No, those are very important points. Um, any thoughts about that from any of our panelists? Well, just briefly, um, and I appreciate um, my colleagues so much in the fact that they're forwarding a lexicon and a, and a language and a literacy um, around um, death and dying. Um, and, and I think that that's what so much of this work for those of us that are in the trenches, and for at least for how I see it, is, well, you know, what is the impact? What are the metrics of these dinners? How many people have advanced care directives as a result? Or how is that blah, blah, blah? For me, it's like, no, 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 we're increasing death literacy. Um, and when you increase literacy in any area, um, you increase empowerment, and you get people to make empowered decisions like they do around their weddings. Um, weddings didn't used to be empowering. Um, they had a re there was a revolution around weddings um, when people started to take ownership over their own weddings um, and decide to plan them. There was also a huge market um, that generated around weddings as a result. So there is a huge field that needs, to, that needs investment and innovation around death and dying as well. But for me, it's that literacy equals empowerment. And we are increasing the literacy. And yes, we need to do it more. And I would say I am, I am one of those people who has it all written down. And I have healthcare representatives, and I have copies. And you know, there's a, every time I leave town, I put the emergency file out on my desk because you never know. Um, you really should do that every day when you go to work. But um, <laughs> but what what the problem with that is? And I do workshops for helping people prepare for death, partly because I agree a death dead body is one of the most awkward objects to suddenly come into possession of, and that is usually how we come into possession of it, with no idea what to do. But doing the planning, like you're saying, talking about it, can create fantasies. It can give you the illusion that it's going to turn out that way. So part of planning for your own death is planning your attitude toward it, because it's not going to go the way you expect. It's, very, it's not going to go at all the way you expect, even if things play out that way. There are surprises all along the way. So we need to plan practically and also create, you know, develop an attitude of open-handedness and curiosity about what really happens and have that conversation with our family as well. And uh, I, I'd add that um, I, I think you're very right to point out the sort of um, sort of fetishization of the funeral, the sort of um, idiosyncrasies that 
um, that um, are becoming uh, common, um, and a failure of sort of generosity on the part of the dying person to recognize that the the funeral isn't isn't for you, right? You're not there. <laughs> right? um, it's for other people, um, and um, it's helpful to have some sort of expression of of who you are that would. But because it's helpful to the people who will uh, who will survive you, and it's the sort of control um, issue that's uh, I think the problem that um, everyone's spoken about. The the one aspect of that I did want to touch on is the control side from the healthcare professionals as well. Um, you know, Hippocrates said that when the patient is overmastered by disease, cease treatment, um, recognizing that medicine is powerless. Um, and, the, and the physicians don't want to believe that. Right? We, we want to think we can control everything too. Um, and we need to and can do a better job of stopping uh, treatments and counseling patients about that when it's too much to do. Uh, we can do a better job of treating patient symptoms than we ever have been able to in the history of humankind right, through palliative care. But then even avoid sort of palliative care triumphalism to think that even the palliative care doctors can make it all go uh, perfectly. And we can't do that either. And we need to, at some point, let go. A, a question here in the front. Hi, I'm Leah. Thank you very much for this panel. It's been wonderful. Um, I have a question, but firstly, to address Michael, I've been following Death Over Dinner since uh, undergrad, and I did my sociology capstone on, um, it was called Why Can't Talking About Death Be Cool, and I've tweeted at you, and you've retweeted, so <laughs> thank you. Um, it's been cool, it's great to like meet you in person. Um, one thing you said it, when you spoke was that your Death Over Dinner conversations are not goal-oriented. Um, and in that undergraduate uh, capstone project, I wanted to talk to millennials, other millennials, about what you can do now um, as far as planning for your death. So even though your conversations aren't goal-oriented, what would you recommend to anyone of any age as far as, like, once you have these conversations, what's the next step? And anyone can answer. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that that's as much of a question for, for anyone. Um, the as far as next steps, um, I, I think that we need innovation around next steps. Um, I think that what we've um, what what we're missing, like the um, the wedding comment about the wedding, uh, you know, planning your death being like planning your wedding, um, and and empowerment. I think that we get very stuck on. Do you have your emergency file? Do you have your advanced care directive? Do you have um, these things that um, aren't that great of a carrot? Um, and the stick isn't that great either. Um, and so we have a we have a um, a failure around getting a lot of that these things completed. So for me, well, I don't want to get people into overly fantasizing um, about um, their miraculous deaths or being overly quote unquote creative, I do think there's tremendous room for innovation around engaging people about, um, like we croak was mentioned, um, but uh, engaging people around thinking about their mortality. Um, I think we have, there's you know hundreds of apps and businesses and projects and initiatives waiting to happen now that the, um, the comfort level is increasing, I mean, um, death was not front page news um, when we started Death Over. Did not you know? We just all watched it. Um, uh, there's been so many people that have contributed to making death much more um, present in our culture. Um, but now it's like constant. Like I, I have to take off the Google um, alerts um, that I used to use to have a hard time raking for and finding content. I had to take off because there's so much content. So there's a lot of content, but there's not a lot of great solutions or innovations. I love Organize. I don't know if you know this organization, Organize, where you can, in certain states, you can tweet that you want to be an organ donor, and that stands as a, um, you know, as a legal, um, you know, identifier um, instead of going to the DMV. Now, I don't know where they are. Organize had a lot of energy around it. Organize.org, and um, but that's an example. Have they wanted to completely revolutionize organ donorship? and young millennials that were getting um, you know, social practice um, money around it, social venture money around it. So I think there's a lot, there's a lot more. So 
I'd say next steps, they're kind of missing, and hopefully millennials uh, will and Gen X will actually create better ones. I think we have time for two more questions. Meredith, is that okay? Maybe one. Okay, but our panelists will be here during the break, so you can ask them individually. Let's take one more question uh, here in the oh. second row. Thanks. Uh, my name is Lucia, and I just wanted to say something that you were reading about Bar Barbara. As being um, more mature now, when you go to physicians, they say statements like, women your age, you know what I mean. I said, no, I don't. <laughs> and I think physicians need to pay attention to the more mature population also, instead of putting us in a general category to look at us as individuals. Since that was short, can we take one more question? One more question. Thank you very much for making that point. Um, sort of to your right, Meredith, yes. Thank you. Um, you used the words planning, empowerment, choice, and control. And I was wondering if you could comment on physician-assisted suicide and euthanasia, symptom or solution. I think that's a question for our ethicist. I think then, yeah. <laughs> That was a plan. Or they are in, yeah. you're in. Yeah. I mean, ob obviously, we could have a symposium just on that, uh, on that question. My, my view is that it's the right question, but perhaps the wrong, uh, the wrong answer um, that, um, that, that, it, that leads, leads to this. Um, I think that um, um, in, the, um, in the end, um, but one, of, one of the things that I think is a motive for it um, is, this, is the sense of absolute control. Um, and um, people who want to be in control um, uh, to the very end, um, uh, when their bodies are no longer absolutely under their control, um, uh, think that life has been drained of its meaning, um, and um, it seems to me, therefore, eliminate what cannot be controlled as the, as the solution. And I think that that's a false, actually a false sense of control, because it's not really, uh, really control. But um, obviously a complicated um, question that we can't really uh, uh, deal with here. But just the control aspect of it, I think, is important. Because when you look at the statistics, the people who actually go through with it um, in the United States, very few will say it's for uncontrolled symptoms, right? Um, it's about loss of independence, loss of dignity, feeling like I'm a burden to other persons, loss of autonomy, loss of control. Um, and so I think that's, that is the real motive, um, but I think um, it's a false sense of control in my view. And I have to speak, I, I'm from Oregon. We passed the first law. Um, I'm very familiar with the, with the results of that law. It's, none of the predictions have come true. It's been a completely different picture than many people anticipated. Um, I would only add, and anybody catch me at the break and I'll give you some statistics, but um, I'm very in favor of these laws and not because they give people control. Um, they give people control over their own ability to move towards something they have no control over. And the idea, I never call it suicide. This is not a person choosing to die. This is a person who knows they have to die. And um, I, I put it in the same category as deciding whether or not I want a dose of morphine that will put me to sleep or I'd like to take a little, ha handle a little pain and stay awake. It is a choice of handling something that you have no choice about. So it, I think of it as a symptom management. And I do know people who've made that choice. It, most, many of the people who get the prescription don't use it and they feel some relief. And uh, yes, I think it's a systematic symptom. It's a symptom of a lack of other kinds of autonomy, but um, great topic for a symposium, Dean. <laughs> yes, clearly so much more that we could talk about, but please join me in thanking our panelists. Well, that was a fantastic